expand our imagination. And welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Bob Orr. Well, it's another busy Friday, and you know what that means. We're going to start, as we often do, with our weekly series Flashpoints with our national security analyst, Juan Zarate, who joins me here at the desk. Juan, the, the big focus of the world really is on what's going on in Afghanistan with the Taliban. And there are all these stories about potential peace talks and some kind of deal. What Sort this out for us. Yeah, the, the big question here is, is there reconciliation on the horizon uh, with the Taliban in Afghanistan? Is it possible? Can it be done? Uh, lots of stories, lots of speculation, actually lots of confusion, I think. And you see a lot of confusion among the Taliban themselves. Not quite clear if the news stories are true. But I think the, the collection of news stories does indicate that there is a more serious push for a political solution to what's happening in Afghanistan. And that means some form of reconciliation with the Taliban. Not just bringing Taliban fighters in uh, to the country, uh, reconciling those fighters who are willing to lay down their arms, but coming to some political solution uh, with the Taliban leadership itself. Lots of problems with that, though, Bob, as I think most people understand. First of all, the Taliban is very fractured. Uh, it's not clear that you have one single hierarchy other than the leadership of Mullah Omar, who sits in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, you have a weak government in uh, President Karzai, so it's not clear that they are respected. You've got the enemy in some way, the Taliban, waiting out the U.S., seeing what will happen in July of 2011 when we're supposed to begin our drawdown. And then you've got countries like Pakistan, which have an interest in how this plays out and may not have uh, a, a negotiated solution sort of uh, fully in mind yet, given their own interests. And so there are a lot of obstacles, uh, aside from the interests of, of each party uh, in each side, to getting reconciliation, to getting a political solution. But it's clear the U.S. wants this as a track uh, to uh, complement the military surge and the push uh, and what we're doing to hit the Taliban pretty hard uh, with our military. Very interesting. General Petraeus, among others, kind of came out and gave some credence to this, saying that uh, some of the Taliban leaders had been escorted to, to these talks. That message, I think, was sent to a lot of different audiences, but he was trying to send a clear message, I think, to the Taliban that this is a serious effort. I think that's exactly right, and the reports of NATO actually ferrying Taliban leadership into uh, into Kabul and maybe even some leadership meeting in Saudi Arabia, I think has been uh, something that is uh, not only real, but something, as you said, that General Petraeus has wanted to put out there. I think they want to sow some division within the Taliban. They want to create confusion, and they want to create opportunities for people to actually come in and talk. The question here is, you know, are the Taliban leaders who are willing to talk, are they able to bring troops with them? Are they able to actually make decisions? And will they be allowed to? For example, will some of their uh, handlers and alliances in Pakistan uh, be willing to allow the Taliban to strike a deal that may not be advantageous to, for example, the Pakistani intelligence services? And going forward, how do you verify that kind of deal? I mean, are we going to negotiate a treaty with the Taliban? And how do you trust that that holds? Well, I think there are two great questions that come from that. First, are the initial conditions that each side has, are they negotiable? Uh, the Taliban wants the U.S. and NATO forces out you know, right away. Uh, the Afghan government and the U.S. want uh, the Taliban to come in, lay down their arms, uh, lay allegiance to uh, and pledge allegiance to the Afghan constitution and break their alliance with al-Qaeda. These are very serious things. And even if they were to come in and were to agree to this, uh, would that uh, agreement hold? Would it be enforceable? And do they speak for everybody? And do they speak for everybody? Right. And that goes back to what I said about the fractured nature of the Taliban. So this is all very difficult, but it's part of a strategy to say there is a political end game here, and it's a complement to the military surge and push that we have in Afghanistan. All right. Item number two this week, uh, Lebanon. From time to time, Lebanon pops up in the news. It's always a hot spot. What's going on there now that gives you concern? Lebanon is a powder keg, Bob. Uh, you have uh, the government, which is weak, led by Prime Minister Saad Hariri, under great deal of pressure internally from Hezbollah and its allies, and then externally from Iran and Syria. Uh, the recent visit from Ahmadinejad uh, to Lebanon sort of underscored uh, the reality that Iran and Syria are exerting more and more influence again in Lebanon, uh, trying to pressure uh, not only what's happening internally, but trying to uh, get the government to help uh, dissuade and stop this tribunal 
looking at the death of uh, Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, the father of the current Prime mm -hmm. Minister, Saad Hariri. That now has become the linchpin issue in Lebanon, one that could actually lead to war within Lebanon, could lead to the toppling of the government, uh, in part because Hezbollah will likely be named as the primary suspect uh, in the killing of primary, uh, Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. So how does all that square, though? Because Iran being a, a patron and a sponsor of Hezbollah, how does, how does this end? Well, this does not end well, I think, for Lebanon, in part because I don't see uh, there being any chance that this U.N. tribunal, it's a U.N. tribunal, uh, th that that ends at any point. And so they're going to conclude, I think, given what we've heard, that Hezbollah or parts of Hezbollah were responsible for the death of a Lebanese prime minister. For Hezbollah, that is devastating because they have sold their credentials internally within Lebanon as a legitimate resistance movement against Israel and as a legitimate political uh, representative of the Shia in Lebanon. If they are then deemed to be guilty of killing the prime minister of Lebanon, that crushes any semblance of legitimacy. And that's why they're fighting this so hard, Bob. They're fighting it in the cabinet meetings where they have a voting block. Uh, they want the cabinet to agree to cancel the tribunal. Uh, they want there to be hearings within Lebanon about the sufficiency of the evidence. So this tribunal itself could be the linchpin for conflict. And you have Iran and Syria very much trying to, uh, to support Hezbollah and trying to defeat uh, what may come out of this tribunal. Because I think Syria, uh, you know, may have blood on its hands as well, based on what this tribunal has to say. Well, it's uh, obviously a troubled spot in a troubled region. Let's move on to the UK. Uh, everyone, uh, most European countries, this country, uh, the economic problems are, are real. And now the UK, they're coming across with some very, very large cuts. Yeah, Pri Prime Minister uh, Cameron has come, uh, come with some significant cuts to the budget across the board, including to the defense budget. The defense budget is being cut by 8% over the next four years, uh, uh, which means the British military and, and the projection of British force uh, will be diminished over time. They will have less of everything, 95,000 less uh, army troops. They won't have uh, air aircraft carrier uh, lift. That means aircraft uh, that, that can fly onto or from an aircraft carrier for about 10 years. The Harrier uh, jet has been discontinued. Uh, they've discontinued a reconnaissance plane. Uh, and so this is serious. This is a, a big cut to one of the world's great uh, militaries and powers and one that the U.S. relies on heavily to project power abroad. Now, the British government is saying quite clearly we still need to and want to project power. Uh, but I think realistically this uh, signals a bit of a diminishment of the British ability to project power uh, beyond its borders. Well, Great Britain is our first ally always. So going forward, if we get into a tight spot, we need to leverage some friendly help, you're saying that maybe they don't have as much help as they used to. I think that's right. You see an adjustment in the budget to look at uh, things like funding special forces, uh, funding cyber security, cyber defense. Uh, but what you do see very clearly is that the British military will not be able to sustain long-term engagements like we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan or engage in big, large-scale wars for a long period of time. And so. Uh, if the United States were to look to the U.K. as a primary backer in a major conflict, for example, with Iran or China, let's say, uh, that looks less and less likely to be something reliable. And that, as the U.S. looks at its own defense budget and cuts, as Secretary Gates has talked about, that becomes a, a, an area of worry because the U.K. not only has had the resources in the past and the manpower and the equipment, but they've been willing to fight with us. And if that is diminished over time, that diminishes the U.S. ability to project force as well. And just one, one more point on, th on this topic. What about the fight against uh, terrorism? I mean, we know the U.K. is in the, in the target list uh, for major terror groups like al-Qaeda, and they've got a homegrown problem there that's significant. Yeah. Do you suspect this kind of economic squeeze also hurts that? Well, I think it's affecting everything. I think clearly the defense uh, budget is getting hit. The foreign office budget, the, their State Department is getting cut by 26% over the next four years. Um, their intelligence services, law enforcement are having to take some cuts, having to refine certain things. I know, for example, on some of their own homegrown projects, which they call the PREVENT program, uh, they're having to, uh, to reevaluate the funding for some of those programs. And so, Certainly how they deal with terrorism is important, but it's clear that they're trying to make the case that the defense budget cuts are being aligned with a reframed strategy. That is mm -hmm. to look at the problems that they have today, terrorism, 
cyber uh, attacks uh, and other things that are more asymmetric and less about grand warfare and grand programs. And as we look around at all the hot spots, we, we often try to find that one bright spot and you think you found it in Chile. I think so. I think uh, the success uh, extracting the 33 miners is really an important window through which to view uh, what is really a success story in the southern cone. Uh, Chile has, has had remarkable socio-economic uh, success over the last 20 years. A free market economy devoted to free trade uh, with political stability, the change of presidents uh, since the age of Pinochet, five handovers of, of presidents, very uh, well-respected leaders. This latest uh, billionaire entrepreneur, Sebastián uh, Piñera, uh, has done a great job by all accounts in his handling. And the of this, world knows who he is now. The world they saw him on television. certainly knows who he is now. Yeah. And, uh, and this, I think, highlights the success in Chile. Uh, they will have 6% growth this year. Uh, they want to they uh, create about a million jobs over the next four years. Their export trade is increasing. They're China's greatest uh, partner, trading partner in South America, uh, in part because of the copper resources in Chile. Uh, it's an open society, one that accepts innovation, wants innovation, and has had political stability now for some time. And I think the success of this story really puts to bed some of the nightmares of the Pinochet era and, and the memories of that. Uh, and also some of the nightmares of the recent uh, earthquake, which I think a lot of us mm -hmm. have already forgotten about, right. uh, in part because the Chileans have handled it so well. And so Chile has a lot to be proud of. They've saved the lives of 33 miners, but they've done a lot over the last 20 years to make their country uh, successful uh, across the board. It's a good place to leave it. Let's Juan, do it. Thanks as always, and have a good weekend. You too, Bob. All right, and now on to our series, Behind the Ballot. And this week, we caught up with John Hickenlooper. He's the Democratic mayor of Denver, who's now running for the governor of Colorado. CBS News chief political consultant Mark Ambender recently spoke to Hickenlooper. Take a look at Mark's report. Mayor Hickenlooper, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, the economy is in the tank. Voters are very angry, and, and there are at least three ballot initiatives uh, that, if passed, would make it much more difficult for the next governor and legislature to make spending decisions. So why? Why do you want to be governor amid, amid all this? <laughs> well, you know, in the end, I think that I am better suited to turn this state around and, and, and get people back to work than, than anybody else. You know, I was started out as a business person, came out of, to Colorado as a geologist and in the recession of the early 80s, I got laid off and had to kind of reinvent myself and opened restaurants across the country. And I think that experience, plus having, you know, at least some experience in, in government as mayor of Denver, is what we need if we're going to really reinvent ourselves and, and, and create a culture that is, you know, pro-business, but at the same time, you know, protecting our land and waters and, and our quality of life. Uh, the Republican Party in your state is uh, in, in chaos. I don't, I don't need to tell you that. And, and there are a lot of folks who think that well, one reason why you're doing so well compared to other Democrats running statewide is simply because people... Uh, are turned off by the Republican candidate and, and uh, Tom Tancredo, who is, uh, who is uh, running outside the party. So are voters voting uh, for you or against Republicans? <laughs> I don't know. That's a hard one to answer. Uh, you know, we've seen polls that if you took either one of them out, I'm still, uh, still leading. What we've tried to do is talk about, you know, how we can bring a business perspective to turn this economy around. How can we make government smaller like we've done in, in the city. The city is 7% fewer employees than when we started. We want to do that same thing in the state, but do it in a way that, you know, defines Colorado as a place that does things differently, that we can be innovative. Uh, and we can be, again, pro-business, but at the same time, uh, pro-neighborhood and pro-quality of life. Um, your former school superintendent, Michael Bennett, uh, now the senator and incumbent, uh, is, is uh, facing a real tough uh, re-election or election because this is his first um, his first real election. What lessons from from your campaign do you think uh, might uh, might might benefit him? You're doing much better than he is uh, in in Denver suburbs, for example. Well, I don't think Michael uh, needs me to give him any advice. I mean, he's one of the hardest working, you know, smartest people I know. He's just in a very a different race. He's you know in Washington and is perceived by people as part of Washington, even though this is the first time he's ever run for office, right? Yeah. Uh, he's being perceived as this incumbent. Uh, really, when you look at it, Michael's probably one of the few people who actually could change Washington. Uh, he's got the social skills and the smarts to, to really do that. But he's in a, you know, he's in a tough race, but he, he's a hard worker. I mean, I, I would think anybody, nobody should, should write him off. He's, he's in it for the right up to, right up to the last day. Um, 
one of your ads, one of your earliest ads, very memorable, shows you literally uh, stepping out of the shower, the image of you clean, promised not to run any negative ads, um, and you haven't so far. Uh, but uh, Tom Tancredo, in, in some polls, is creeping up to you. So between now and the election, are you still going to uh, uh, hold yourself to the, uh, I guess you'd call it the shower promise? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, we, we made a, a commitment for a reason, right? The, these negative attack ads are, are such short-term, they're appealing to anger and, and, and frustration, but, but they really leave jagged scars. And there's a reason why General Motors doesn't do attack ads against Toyota or McDonald's against Burger King. When you, when you do an attack ad, not only are you putting down your, your competitor or your opponent, but you're also diminishing all the people that believe in them. And what, what happens is, after the election, people can't come together. And at this point, this country needs, you know, no, I tell people that Election Day, November 2nd, is not the end, it's the beginning. And we need Democrats and Republicans and independents. Everybody's got to come together and say, all right, where are those places we agree? And let's get, let's get to work turning the economy around. Let's fix our schools. You know, let's get our transportation system so it works. But, but let's do it together. Well, Mayor Hickenlooper, thanks very much for joining us. Oh, you bet. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And now we're going to turn to hot ads of the week with our political producer, Jill Jackson, one of my favorite segments. And we start in Nevada, right? We do. And some are calling this the first ad of 2012. Let's take a look. Our troubled economy isn't news. 600,000 Americans have lost their jobs since January. Paychecks are flat and home values are falling. It's hard to pay for gas and groceries, and if you put it on a credit card, they've probably raised your rates. You're paying more than ever for health insurance that covers less and less. This isn't just a string of bad luck. The truth is that while you've been living up to your responsibilities, Washington has not. president was on the ballot in uh, Nevada. That's what you'd think, at least for the first half of the ad. This comes as President Obama arrives in Nevada today to campaign again with, with Harry Reid, who's in a very tough race against Sharon Engel. Um, you know, they're really capitalizing on the promises of 2008. You, can, you know, it's interesting to remember how the, all of those, all the promises he made. And two years later, Nevada is in such bad shape with the 14% uh, 14 foreclosure rate, and the ad makers really exploited that. And the message resonates with voters, and people are angry, they're upset, and that race is still hair tight, right? Hair, hair tight, and you know, President Obama's, his popularity is not very strong in that state, and so he, at this time, and, and he's, you know, it's not good to be tying Reid once again that closely to President Obama. Okay, we're going to go to ad number two, and I, even without seeing the ad, I love this. A Aqua Buddha? This was the talk of the week. It dominated political conversations, the blogs, but yes, let's take a look at Aqua Buddha. <laughs> I'm Jack Conway. I approve this message. Why was Rand Paul a member of a secret society that called the Holy Bible a hoax that was banned for mocking Christianity and Christ? Why did Rand Paul once tie a woman up, tell her to bow down before a false idol, and say his god was Aqua Buddha? Why does Rand Paul now want to end all federal faith-based initiatives and even end the deduction for religious charities? Why are there so many questions about Rand Paul? <laughs> There's a lot of questions. Yeah, it is. And, you know, the, they got this story from a, a woman, the woman who actually was allegedly kidnapped told, told this story to GQ and to the Washington Post. And um, Jack Conway, the Democratic candidate for Senate in Kentucky, really just ran with it in that ad. Uh, Rand Paul, however, really was mostly concerned about the attack on his faith. So his campaign came out with this ad. I'm Rand Paul, and I approve this message. Now Jack Conway is attacking Rand Paul's faith. 
Rand Paul keeps Christ in his heart and in the life he shares with his wife and three boys. Don't be fooled by Conway's desperate attack. It's shameless, disgraceful, gutter politics at its worst. What kind of shameful politician would sink this low to bear false witness against another man just to win an election? This one would. Jack Conway. So in Conway's head, he took a very serious event, tried to make some light of it, and tried to yep. cast aspersions on Rand Paul, but Rand Paul really went for like the moral. Absolutely, and, and clearly Conway's ad made him angry. I mean, he, they had a debate on Sunday night, and he refused to shake Conway's hand. His wife, uh, Rand Paul's wife, held a press conference this week to defend his religious beliefs. Um, they were truly offended. What's interesting, if you think about it, though, is that the election is a week and a half away, and they're talking about faith and aqua buddhas. There's no talk about issues really at this stage in the campaign. So this Senate race is really turning into one of the nastiest. At this point with days to go though, it's just anything goes. Exactly. Right? No Throw something door. and see what sticks. Okay, now we started with Nevada. I guess we're going to go back there. Yep, let's go back to Nevada. This is from, uh, you know, Sharon Engels benefited from a lot of outside spending from outside groups, but this ad actually is meant to help out Harry Reid and it's from the SEIU. So this is union money funding this ad. Sharon Engel's dangerous ideas will make her life worse at every stage. If she was raped and got pregnant, Engel would force her to have the baby. Her college loans ended. If she's looking for work, it's tough luck with Sharon Engel. At retirement, her social security phased out. At every stage, it would be worse for her, worse for all of us. Sharon Engel, too dangerous to have real power over real people. SEIU COPE is responsible for the content of this advertising. Wow, that's, there's some real anger out there. Yeah, it's very really harsh. Tapping I mean, into the most negative things they can. Tapping into the most negative things they can. And really, at this point, they're hope, the Democrats and liberal organizations are hoping that this extreme label really starts to stick on some of these candidates. At the moment, the reed angle race is still so close. So, uh, you know, they're using fear and that extreme label to just tr really try and somehow change these numbers and get the Democrat ahead. Well, we've seen stories. Take off your ad hat now. Mm -hmm. Put on your mm -hmm. analyst hat. We're just a week and a half or so away from the election. Is it still trending very strongly to the Republicans? What, what, did, what did your tea leaves tell you? Everyone, everyone's seeing a little bit of tightening in the, for the Democrats, but we haven't necessarily, in favor of the Democrats, but we haven't necessarily seen that in Nevada yet. Um, it's basically what all the analysts and, and even some of the organizations themselves uh, on the Republican side and Democratic side say that it's normal for Democrats to, to be gaining at this point because many Democratic voters are just starting to pay attention while Republicans had all that Tea Party energy and mm -hmm. enthusiasm that has been keeping those voters engaged all year. Well, Tuesday night election night is going to be a lot of fun to watch. Very interesting. And a lot of nervous politicians around. Jill, thanks very much. And finally, President Obama is on a mini campaign this week swinging through the West Coast states to stump for Democrats in some of those tight races. With a week and a half to Election Day, the White House press corps tagged along to see if the Obama magic from 2008 is still alive from places like Oregon to Minnesota. Our cameraman Don Lee gives us now a behind-the-scenes look at the White House press corps on a cross-country trip. This is the press charter. It's a little nicer than some, but it's kind of like a, a flying clown car or a circus train. You know, everyone kind of is at home here for the day and for the, the three days we're going to be out. And everyone kind of makes themselves at home and relax, and have food, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast of champions. Just non-stop action, different location, new conditions. And uh, you just have to be prepared uh, for uh, whatever comes up. Uh, we carry a lot of equipment with us. Um, some people laugh, saying maybe we take it too much, but you know what? Our job is to uh, make sure that uh, everything we record is done correctly, and, uh, and we pretty much do it. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. buses, we're moving on the plane, we're getting catering and things like that to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all together um, to make sure that we're getting the best coverage or that you guys are the press corps getting the best coverage. Of the
advertising in the skies for people like us. down in Seattle is 10.30, so then we'll get to the hotel probably about 11.30 after all of the loading and all that good stuff. So what time is that East Coast time? What is that, 2.30 a.m.? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 2.30 a.m. and we started at 6, so it's quite a long day. The chaos of the campaign trail, thanks to our cameraman Don Lee for that essay. And thanks to you for watching Washington Unplugged. Watch us here every day on CBSNews.com. I'm Bob Orr. Have a great weekend.